Last night I was uh, up in my office preparing this message and uh, I had, had a message all prepared on John 13 through 16, which is the upper room discourse, it's called, where Jesus spoke with his disciples on the last night of his life for uh, about 20 minutes, it was, that he just spoke to them before they left the upper room and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's only in John's Gospel, this upper room discourse. It's, it's like marching orders. And so I was all prepared, and my wife had told me that during the week she had listened audibly through this with her audible Bible, and she said, you know, you ought to try that because it's an amazing experience just sitting in it, as if you're in the upper room just sitting. So to prepare my own heart for the message, uh, from 4.30 to 5 last night in my office, instead of reading my notes, I clicked on my audio Bible, and a British guy named Max came up, and he started being Jesus to me. And he, he walked me right through the upper room discourse audibly. And uh, I felt myself sitting in it. And it was as if Jesus said to me, he didn't say something audibly to me, but he said, Bob, why don't you just let me speak it to the people like you just heard it? Why don't you just read it? Besides, Bob, which do you think they'd prefer? Listening to you for 30 minutes or me for 20? I said, well, I'll defer to you any day. And so uh, last night, it was actually, I, I had to wrestle with that a lot. It was like five minutes before I got up here. I went back and told the folks on the board, I said, I, I just don't know if I'm going to do this or not. I just am feeling like I should, but I'm not sure. And I did. I just read it. And I tried to read it with a little bit of in, interest and emphasis and throw in a few little nuggets here and there. And I'm going to do that right now. And what I would ask you to do is sit in it. Like pretend you're in the upper room right now, just you. And there's other people with you, but it's you. And as much as possible, and I'll pray for this in a moment, just drive out everything. We're just not an audible culture anymore, you know? We gotta jazz everything up to stay attuned. But my prayer is that you could just audibly hear Jesus speak for a few minutes and that you would drive out other distractions if you need to, close your eyes and just be alone with him as he speaks and let him take you through the upper room discourse. Jesus, my prayer is that you would speak and we would listen. You said you would send your Holy Spirit to guide us into your words, to remind us of all that you said and I pray you would send your Holy Spirit right now to guide us into what you said, to bring your words alive to us each, and to minister to them appropriately, because you know every person here, you know exactly what they need. And I pray you would speak, and we would listen. So it was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go back to his Father. Having loved his own disciples who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He knew that he had come forth from the Father and was about to go back to the Father. And so knowing all of that, he got up from the table and slipped away. The disciples were having an argument as to which of them was the greatest. Without realizing it, Jesus was gone. He was in another part of the room taking off his robes and girding himself with a towel and filling a basin with water. The next thing they knew, he was at their feet, washing them one by one and drying their feet with the towel, the task of the household servant. But because it was a secret of Last Supper, there was no servant to do that work. So Jesus became the house servant and he washed their feet. He came to Peter and Peter said, Lord, do you wash my feet? 
And Jesus said, what I do now, you do not understand, but you will understand later. And Peter said, never. You, wash my feet, never. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter said, then wash my head and my hands and my feet. And Jesus said, he who has bathed is clean and needs only to wash his feet. The rest of his body is clean. And you are all clean. Well, not all of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put his robes back on, and he said to his disciples, do you understand what I have just done? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And if I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've given you an example. I want you to do to one another what I have done for you. No servant is greater than his master. No pupil is greater than his teacher. If I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, so you should wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Descending into greatness, washing feet, taking the role of servant. Then Jesus became troubled and he quoted an Old Testament scripture. Behold, the one who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me and his heart became troubled, very troubled. And he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. The disciples were troubled. They were at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was John, the gospel writer, he was leaning close to Jesus because that's how they ate. They, they were lying on the floor and they would lean their head into the one next to them. And Peter motioned to the disciple whom Jesus loved, whose head was resting close to Jesus' chest, ask him, who is it? Who's the betrayer? And so John whispered to Jesus, Lord, who is it? And Jesus said, it is the one to whom I will give this morsel of bread after I have dipped it in the sauce. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, the bread of the Passover, the symbol of God passing over our sins, the symbol of forgiveness, the symbol of mercy, the offer of mercy, as soon as Judas took it, the devil entered him. Because you see, he had already planned the betrayal. He had already gone to the high priest. He had already negotiated the blood money, 30 shekels of silver. Never says he ate the bread. Just says he took it. What you do, do quickly, Jesus said. But no one at the meal understood what Jesus meant. They thought he was telling Judas, who was the keeper of the money, the treasurer of the group, to go and buy supplies for the feast or perhaps to give an offering to the poor because of the festival. They had no idea. And as soon as Judas had taken that bread, he went out and it was night. It was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man will be glorified. And God will be glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself. God will glorify him immediately. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews before, where I'm going, you can't come. You can't come. A new command I give to you. Love one another. Just as I've loved you, love one another. This is the way the world will know you're my followers if you love one another. When they see you loving one another, when they see you washing each other's feet, when they see you living with humility, considering one another more important than yourselves, they're going to know you're different. 
love one another. That's the badge of my disciples. Peter was disturbed. Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, Peter, where I'm going, you can't come. You can't follow. Peter said, I'll follow you wherever you go. I will follow you to the death. Nothing will stop me. Jesus said, really? Peter, tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. They were disturbed. Jesus is leaving. What's going on? He's leaving. What, what's going on? Somebody's going to betray him. Somebody's going to disown him. What's going on? Jesus looks at them and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Listen, trust in God. Trust me. Trust me. Listen, no matter what happens, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place just for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If this were not true, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he, he set them up with one of his trick questions. Oh, and you know the way where I'm going. Thomas, the rationalist, said, well, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Father. <laughs> Philip's listening. Philip says, show us, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Just show us the Father. Jesus says, Philip, have I been so long with you and you haven't come to know me? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you say, show us the Father? Don't you understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father? Don't you understand the words that I say? These are not my own. It's the Father who's been living in me. It's the Father who's been speaking through me. It's the Father who's been doing all of these miracles. Believe me when I say, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. And guess what? I tell you the truth, that the works the Father has done through me you're going to do those very same works. In fact, you are going to do greater works than I did because I'm going to the Father. I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father through you. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, another one, because I was the first one, the paraclete, the one called alongside to help, the advocate. I've been with you for three years, but I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another one like me, another paraclete, the spirit of truth. And he will be with you forever. The world cannot accept him because it doesn't see him. It doesn't know him. It doesn't understand the Holy Spirit. But you know him. He lives with you, para, alongside of you. But he's going to live in you. In us? The Spirit in us? What? Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I'm in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Do you love me? Obey me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him, and I will show myself to him. Then Judas, the other one, not Judas Iscariot, he says, Lord, what are you intending to do? How are you going to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will obey me. Do you love me? Obey me. And my Father will love him, and we, 
the Father and I will come to him. And we, the Father and I, will make our home in your hearts. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All of this I have spoken to you while I was with you. But this Holy Spirit, this counselor, this other advocate whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he will bring to your remembrance everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Not that kind of peace. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and coming back. If you love me, you'd be glad because I'm going to my Father. If you love me, you'd be glad because I'm going to my Father. I've told you now before it happens, so when it does, you'll believe. And now, the prince of this world is coming to take me. But he has nothing on me. So that the world may know that I love the Father, I must obey his command. Arise. Let's go. I have a cross to bear. If you love me, you'll obey me. And so they begin the journey to the garden and they walk by a vineyard and Jesus stops and gives us the sixth I am. He spoke in Aramaic, but if he had spoken in Greek, it would have been this. He grabs the vine and he says, I am the vine, the true. The true vine. My father is the vine dresser. He cuts away every branch that bears no fruit. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. He trims it. He lifts it up. He binds it to other branches so that it will see, receive light and air. He prunes it so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me. Abide in me. Settle down. Stay connected to me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. You cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a branch remains in me, it will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You'll think you're doing something, but apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that the vine dresser comes and throws away into the fire. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then pray, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. <laughs> because you're praying connected to me. You're praying words back to me that are my very own words that are filling you. And if you're praying in that spirit, connected to me and filled with my heart, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey me, you love me. Do you love me? Obey me just as I have obeyed the Father's commands and I remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made complete. I know you're sad. I know you're troubled. I know you're worried. But I'm telling you these marching orders so that in this world you will have a joy that's different. It's not just happiness. It's not circumstances. It's a connection that comes from me. It's a joy, a deep sense of rightness and satisfaction that comes from being connected to me and doing the things that matter to me and praying the prayers that I can answer. It's, 
I'm, I'm saying all this so that your joy might be filled to the full. My command to you is this. Love each other, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. You're my friends, if you obey me. You want to be my friends? Obey me. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you my friends. You are my friends. Because everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you, and you've accepted it. You know, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and I've appointed you that you should go into this world and bear fruit and that your fruit should last forever. Fruit in your hearts, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of other lives that are changed. And then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command to you, love one another. Love one another. Here's why this is so important, my friends, because the world is going to hate you The world will not love you. That is why you must love one another. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world would love you because the world loves its own. But as it is, you don't belong to the world. You live here, but you're really strangers and aliens here. You're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. I've chosen you out of the world. This is why the world's going to hate you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they obeyed me, they'll obey you. But they're going to treat you this way because of my name, for they just don't know the one who sent me. If I hadn't come to them and spoke to them the words of God, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the miracles that God gave me to do, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen the miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. All of this to fulfill that Old Testament saying, they hated me for no good reason. But you know, when the counselor comes in the midst of this world of hate, this counselor, this Holy Spirit whom I will send from the Father, he is the spirit of truth. And he will testify of me. And you also will testify. But he will stand with you. Don't worry about what you will say in that hour. The Holy Spirit will testify in you and through you in that hour of persecution. All of this I have told you so that you will not stumble when it happens. They will put you out of the synagogue. And a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will kill you in the name of God. They will do these things because they've not known the Father or me. I've told you all this so that when it happens, you will remember that I warned you. I didn't tell you this before because I was with you, but I won't be with you much longer. Now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. I can see it. I see the grief. But I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit from the throne room of heaven, that that other helper. I can't send him until I go. If I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. As you testify, he will be testifying with you. And he will convince and convict the world of sin because they have not believed in me. He will convict them of righteousness because I go to be with the Father. And he will convict them of judgment because judgment is real and the prince of this world has already been judged 
I have a lot more to say to you, but you can't bear it now. But he, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He's not going to speak his own thing. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me again. And the disciples were confused. They said to one another, what's he mean? Saying in a little while you'll see me and then in a little while we'll not see you. What's he mean? They kept asking. What's a little while? We don't understand. And Jesus said, I see, you're confused. I see, you don't understand. Let me tell you this way, in a little while, you will see me no more. And you will weep and mourn while the world celebrates. But then your grief will be turned to joy, just like that. It's like a woman giving birth to a child. When she's in the agony of childbirth, (laughs) it's agony. It's pain. But the moment that baby is born, the agony is gone, the pain is forgotten, and there's joy because a child has come. So it is with you. Now is your time of agony. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice. And on that day, no one will ever be able to take that joy from you. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. You'll understand. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have never asked for anything in my name. But ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be full. I've been speaking to you figuratively. A time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language. But I'll tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you. The Father loves you because you have loved me. And you have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and enter the world. Now I'm leaving the world, and I'm going back to the Father. And the disciples said, now we get it. Now you're speaking clearly without figures of speech. Now we see you know all things. We believe that you came from God. And Jesus said, you believe at last. But now a time is coming In fact, it has come when you will each be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. And yet I am never alone because my Father will go on this journey with me. I've told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Thank you, Jesus, for your words. Thank you for the love that's behind those words. Thank you for your care for your disciples. Thank you for allowing us to just sit in it and feel it, and hear it. Take something from these words for each of us and make it stick. We love you. Charlie, come up here for a sec as you lead us in worship. There's something I want to just talk about for one minute. Is in the middle of this sermon is that vine and the branch picture, and you and I were talking this week in programming, and I said, uh, he always asked me, what are you going to emphasize in, in the sermon that I threw away? Um, 
I had a whole big section on abiding in the vine and how important that was. And uh, the little phrase, apart from me, you can do nothing. And Charlie said at programming, that's my life first. And I said, well, then I need to ask you with the flock, why? And so why is that your life first? Yeah, well, you've probably heard that saying, some people got to learn the hard way, and that's, that's kind of me. Um, I had to learn a lot of things the hard way, but when I, when I really started getting serious about Jesus, I still was really immature in my faith, and, and I grew up in a culture where you, you did stuff, you got stuff right, and you cleaned yourself up, and you did stuff for God. And so I developed this incredible plan for my life that I thought God would really like that would really honor him. So it looked like God, looked like good fruit. Uh, but what I realized is it was really more about me and the fruit. The fruit wasn't so good. It kind of looked good on the outside. Um, kinda, you probably heard the, the rumors that grocery stores, they kind of airbrush the fruit that's about ready to turn. You know, you've probably heard rumors like that. I don't know if they're true or not, but they do that so that you take the fruit home and you buy it and then you realize, whoa, this stuff is it's kind of turned. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a picture of, of what I felt like some of the fruit was like in, in, my, in my life. And, and what, what that passage taught me was that God doesn't, he doesn't want me to do stuff for him. He wants me to remain in him so that he can do stuff through me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he's the source. I'm just the stuff that that people see. The people see the fruit because it comes out of us, but it comes from the source. And I had gotten that so backwards. And so with that scripture, it's my life verse because it's so easy for me, it's so easy for me to get caught up in my own agenda. But it's that, it's that little section after the semicolon in verse five, apart from me, you can do nothing that always snaps me back and says, I just need to be where he is. And if you were to encourage our congregation with one or two things that you found help you stay connected, mm -hmm. uh, what would those be? Um, make time to be with him. Just, just as rich as this picture of us sitting here and listening to scripture, like that's to me number one, just putting yourself in a place where you can just hear from God through his scripture and through prayer and, and um, by his spirit. That would be probably number one. And number two, just always, I hold this verse close to my heart, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit because our heart is deceitful above all things. And the enemy comes in and he, and he tells you, yeah, you, you got this right. You can do this. You can make this happen. And uh, anytime it serves myself, I just have to step back and say, okay, God, am I remaining in you? Where am I at with you? So those are a couple things. Well, that's good. While you get your guitar on and get us ready for this next song, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, that idea of spray-painted fruit, I remember when we moved to the Philippines with our young family. Um, I was so excited. We got there, we moved to this Mile High City and uh, I went to the market, because they had a market. You know, you buy everything from fish to fruit and vegetables. And I thought I'd really score by coming home with the food. And so I saw this fruit vendor, and he had these baskets piled high with strawberries, huge red strawberries. And I was so proud. I came home, and I, I set this box, cardboard box, full of strawberries piled high. And we pulled one right off the top. And underneath, it was all red, painted newspaper. <laughs> and I was cheated. And I think it's the same thing. You know, apart from me, you get cheated. Because you think you're doing something. But the way I see it, it's nothing. And I, I don't want that to be a downer for you. I just want you to evaluate that you might think you're doing something, because I do all the time. But if it doesn't grow out of connection with him, you're cheated. It's nothing. Let's worship him. Stay connected to him. I want to invite you just to... Um
yeah, you can stand, you can sit, but we're going to sing this song, and it really captures that uh, remaining. It just says, I want to be where you are. So just use this song as a prayer.
send us out. Just remind us of your words. Just remind us of this time where we just sat and listened and heard from you. God, we just want to be where you are so that our life, so that the fruit, what we do, how we think, how we love one another, that all flows from you, the source. So Holy Spirit, just speak to us this week and help us to live out that command to love one another so that people would know you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen.